Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show episode number 127 with me, your host Agostino. How you doing, how you feeling, what's going the F on? How are you, how you doing, hope you're well hydrated, well rested and all that malarkey. I have just come back from the gymnasium so if you're wondering why I'm a little bit lethargic and I sound like I'm tired and I'm sound like I'm sore and I sound like I might have some sort of muscle fatigue because I've been going to the gym every day since I got back from Manchester it's because I've been going to the gym every day since I got back from Manchester but I hope you guys are doing fine you guys are well I'm good I'm well rested well hydrated I've had some water I've had some coffee um, which made me go to shit straight away, you know, which I love that. Love that morning shit after a good coffee. Um, I've got my eggs inside of me, some spinach and some spring onions sprinkled on there. A little bit of parma ham, a little bit of old slice of cheese I had left there. One piece of toast and we're ready to roll. Here I am. Here we go. Also done 16 hours of, ch- of fasting actually this week. Um, well, these cu- last couple of days. So I- I'm on like a good little course and I'm running myself um, in a good little way. So, um... The silence over the weekend and the silence with, you know, the uploads and stuff is something I'm going to address this week because, you know, I've got more time on my hands. <laughs> oh, you got to love life, innit? Life gives you a lemon and then it chucks you back in your face some stale, um, I don't know, Dr. Pepper, you know? Um, sometimes in life you just get the situation to happen where, where you don't really see... No, you do see it coming, but it's always just funny, isn't it, really, when you end up with a little speed hump. So, um, if the uploads were a bit slow last week, this week will be, you know, jam-packed because I've got more time on my hands to do the uploads. And, yeah, everything is swimmingly going pretty well. First things first, before we get into all that shit, um, got back from Manchester. Went to Manchester for the weekend. Had an absolute whale of a time. So, um, in case um, I haven't know, I don't think I've spoken about it in here, but essentially the whole Manchester um, trip was a an, a bit of an R and D trip, um, research and development going out there because the intention is that in hopefully hopefully by the summer of next year, if not the winter of next year, um, we're aiming to move to Manchester and set up shop. The whole premise behind it is that living in London for the be- well for most of my life. Um, and I'm really kind of fed up with having to pay, you know, extraordinary, exorbitant prices in terms of rent and just general living cost and kind of want to evolve and enter into the next chapter of my life where, you know, I'm a bit, self, I'm a bit, I'm a bit more self-sufficient. I might have an online business by the time I, ru- I run into, by the time I move on to L- London, my DJing stuff might have gone up, you know, my DJing frequency might have gone increased somewhat, I might be getting paid higher rates, I might have um, an opportunity in other things, whatever it may be, so the whole thinking is behind it is that we move to Manchester, we'll cut our living cost by half, um, cut our, you know, budget, overall rent budget by half too, and probably have more bang for our buck, or get more bang for our buck from what we're paying here. So overall, that's kind of the plan. And, you know, since neither of us have been to Manchester, well, I've been to Manchester once. I went for um, for work when I used to work for a, a very large um, art materials manufacturer. And I went there during Freshers Week to set up shop there and kind of help out with all the Freshers Week and set up a stand, all that sort of malarkey, sign up people, um, to help them test out product, which was a bit of a freaky experience, you know, because I never, I never did Freshers. Because like an idiot, I decided to go to a London university and I travelled in from, you know, and it's, and I remember, I think Bill Burr mentioned it. It's like, it's not really university when you do that. It's sort of like you're going to an extended version of college, which I regret to this day. That's probably the only regret I have. I don't have regrets. I don't think you should um, live your life with any kind of regret. But if I do have one, is that I didn't take the chance and go somewhere else. I kind of got enamored with the whole, I kind of got enamored with the whole um, allure of Central St. Martins and the fact that it's one of the best art schools in the world and all that sort of malarkey when essentially I could have done what I did at St. Martins anywhere in the country and still probably came out and still be doing what I'm doing now. Do you know what I mean? Essentially, I, I, I kind of deferred completely from what I studied in university anyway. I'm doing a completely different thing, but um, that's a story for another day. So I've only went to Manchester for that. I didn't necessarily get a chance to walk around or run the city as well when I went to Manchester for work. I kind of did that um, whole, like I went, I went, I think really early in the morning and came out really late at night. Um, you know, workplaces don't let you stay overnight for the most part, but I got popped in a nice hotel, which was great. So it was a chance to kind of go and see Manchester and see how people live there, see what the vibe is, um, 
have a walk around the city center and we we um, we specced up a couple of places that we might want to move to in terms of areas and we walk to one of the apartments didn't get to see inside just kind of walk to a general area get to kind of see uh, a vibe of how it is densest wise and one thing you realize quite quickly when you're in cities outside of london is that things on a map that look like they're further aren't as far as you think they're going to be i'm not sure why it is right but when you look at a google map of london and you're searching for somewhere to go to or somewhere you want to, you know, somewhere you want to visit or you're meeting a friend up, whatever. It's always a little bit further than what you think it's going to be, right? Um, It's not as close as you think, like distances in London. That could be because it's just bigger. So you're having to zoom in more and distances look a bit shorter than what they're meant to look like. But we noticed in Manchester, from that the city centre out to the south takes about half an hour walk. And um, the difference in pricing from an apartment in the in the city centre to the to kind of just outside the the um, the main ring is maybe three or four hundred pounds, which is a big jump. But you can essentially walk to quote unquote work or walk to you know any kind of city centre that you want to or any kind of you know major point in the center within 30 minutes or within 20 minutes within if you live outside the ring. So that'll be a pleasure that I really want to. Um, realize you know the idea that i can walk to work or walk to an office or walk to a studio that would be fucking amazing um and, uh, and something that i haven't been able to do at all in london um in the in the years that i've lived here i've never worked i've never lived anywhere that's close to my work primarily because i never wanted to pay the money to live to have that kind of luxury i know some of my friends do and it's just the prices they pay is absolutely nuts compared to what we pay for like a one bedroom flat um that's not something i want to do personally because you have to give up a lot you have to kind of sacrifice quite often if you want to live let's say um if you work in shortage and you want to live next next to Shoreditch, I don't know, let's say an old street, let's say maybe Angel, kind of, you can maybe walk down that one road, right, and get back down to Shoreditch, you have to, you have to, you, you have to pay for that privilege, but I'd much rather live in zone three, and kind of like travel inwards, and kind of save a whole bunch of money, and also, you know, generally just peace of mind, not having to come back and bumping into, um, you know, hordes and hordes of hipsters going out to party on a weekend is something that I will not give up lightly. But yeah, Manchester was absolutely awesome. Great little city centre. We had we had some great breakfast spots that we visited throughout the city. Um, throughout the city, um, brunch is massive in Manchester. You realise quite often, quite quickly when you're there. Um, there is a big culture of like families, which you don't see a lot of it here. I know I mentioned it, I think in passing, but you don't really see a lot of families going out and having brunch in London. You might see it in more. You might see it just outside. Of, you might see it in places like Essex or whatever. It might be, but in, for the most part, you don't. You see maybe groups of friends uh, going out for drinks. We don't necessarily see a, a massive group of a, a big family going out. And you see that we saw that all weekend. We saw it on Friday. We saw it on Saturday. We saw it on Sunday just before we left. Families go out quite often in Manchester. Um, group, big groups of people go out in, in general in Manchester, which I'm assuming because it's a smaller city. There's no need to go out on your own. Um, I didn't even see as many solo people that you do in London. You definitely see more ones and twos just hanging around. In Manchester, it seemed as if like everyone was in groups of three or more. Um, the nightlife scene, we didn't get to go to any clubs, but we just kind of walked around the areas. was as wild as I thought it was going to be. Um, there's a weird distinction between like... Um, Weatherspoon type places that have DJs playing in there that playing like top 40 chart stuff right from like 30 years 30 years ago and like actual like nightclubs run it so there's a weird distinction between them um for the most part you know you get them the most you know the kind of you know the a general everyday public every you know everyday everyday Joe goes to the kind of the Weatherspoon type place and then you're, you're more glammed up um you know what you call it uh, Essex looking makeup slabbing kind of girl goes to the nightclub but for the most part they all seem fairly innocent um, they wouldn't harm a fly they're all fairly jovial everyone's really having a good time and yeah they, they really really love their weekends up there man everyone really really gets on it like you know people down tools get ready as we saw robe we saw so many girls like in the standard you know with um what you call it with the hair curls in their hair and shit um carrying a massive bag probably full of clothes and their pajamas going to a friend's house we saw so many before like early in the afternoon so they really take going out really seriously especially if they're going to get the fake tan on i'm assuming it's going to take a bit of time to get that all sorted um guys as well not wearing jackets just wearing long sleeve shirts and shit walking through the seat center going to a bar or a club like insane man i was wearing a bomber jacket a hoodie a t-shirt and a vest underneath and a woolly hat and a scarf and i was fucking freezing you know what i mean i had my hands in my pockets the whole time hunched over and there was groups of lads like walking towards us like pale as pale as anything um just wearing a white t-shirt 
or white long sleeve with skinny jeans and trainers heading out. I was like, fuck me, man. These guys are absolute soldiers. I don't know how they do it up there, but I guess you get conditioned over time. Um, skinny jeans are fucking massive in, in outside London. You don't really, because I'm saying, I feel there's a bit of a shift. It seems like a big, there's, you know, people are wearing looser fitting trousers. I wouldn't say they're wearing as big of trousers as I do, but looser fitting trousers in London for the most part. It's kind of, you know, maybe because it's epicenter of fashion, it makes more sense. People are a bit more in tune or even, even without them realizing by osmosis because they're, they, you know, they're walking around the city centre, they're walking on Oxford Street, you get to see what's going on, you get to see the shapes and aesthetic that's happening. You just end up kind of like um, taking it on for yourself. But in Manchester, there's skinny jeans everywhere. And when I mean skinny, I mean like what I used to wear, like fucking spray on. Do you know what I mean? Tights. It's still really big over there. I was like, fuck, it's weird. Isn't it? You don't really see that many people in London wearing that kind of style. And it wasn't even skinny jeans and big hoodies. It was just like skinny everything. Um, that's huge out there for the for the lads. But the lads are very well put together. I have to be honest with that. Um, male grooming in Manchester is a lot better than male grooming in London. Um, for the most part, for one... There's head, there's hairdressers and hair salons everywhere. I don't think I went past. I don't think there was one street I walked past where there wasn't a barber or salon or something. Barbers and barbers and hairdressers in Manchester. I saw like chicken shops in London. They're fucking everywhere. Not not that many chicken shops. I realized quite a lot of good restaurants and kebabs and stuff that people go to. And we went to some really nice pizza joint that had like those square pizzas. But for the most part, not not many chicken shops. I thought there would be quite a couple of kebab spots, but not many like fried chicken shops for the for the most part because there's not that many um, quote unquote Indian um, people there anyway setting up shop. Uh, mostly, you know, it's like there are some like Turkish guys that have to kebab shop, but there isn't a big Indian community because we didn't see that many off Latin Ziva, which is another observation. But yeah, like you can't you can't live in Manchester. I think realization you can't live in Manchester and do what I do and, and get a haircut every once once every three months. Do you know what I mean you have to get a haircut regularly? Like the guys in Manchester don't fuck around. People take gr- male grooming. They take grooming very very seriously. Um, the male barber shops that we walk past or salons and stuff were absolutely packed her rafters people in there you know getting their trim ready for the weekend and stuff so that's one thing i realized um what else what else oh the the pubs are great great craft beer scene out there as i expected um they like to get on the drink a lot there and just in general just a good vibe man um i ended up going to watch the wilder and tyson fury vibe uh fight sorry in um in yates which is sort of i'm assuming like a weather spoons um but they show sports in there. Cause I'm, I don't know why Weatherspoons in London don't show sports. I'm pretty sure they don't have a license. But I do remember back in the day, Weatherspoons do, did used to have a TV that you could watch like sports and stuff. But they don't do that anymore. I don't think they even show like terrestrial TV in some Weatherspoons, which is fucking strange. But, you know, say la vie. But I went to go watch the um, Wilder and Fury fight in uh, Yates um, pub. I just Googled whatever place was um, showing it um end up um because we stayed in an easy hotel there which was you know a bit of a shitty hotel but you know for the most part wasn't that bad just the bed was super uncomfortable it was sort of like sleeping on concrete but hey you know it's an easy hotel what do you expect um but I'm, i would much prefer to just pay the extra 50 quid and stay in a normal hotel but again it's, it's our first time we'll probably next time we go we'll probably have a little bit more of a idea what to do because the last thing i wanted to do was kind of get do an airbnb because we we're gonna we're, we're, we're arriving early in the morning i didn't want the hassle of having to meet the host get the key just to stay for a, for a weekend didn't really make sense all that hassle to get done for that but um and plus as well when we looked anyway there wasn't that many airbnbs in manchester anyway maybe that weekend was busy and they were all gone but it didn't seem like there was any airbnbs what, what what we did see though was someone renting out a caravan in the that was parked in their driveway which was fucking nuts imagine fucking imagine booking a caravan parked in a driveway for your for your stay going to another country sorry i'm going to another city in england that's fucking absolutely crazy so yeah i decided to google where the fight was i saw yates around the corner for the hotel i didn't want to go anywhere too far and yeah man um interesting experience to say the least um the yates were charging five quid to go in they sort of closed the pub at two and then reopened again at three to give the the, the workers time enough to clean and shit and get stuff spick and span we got in just before 3 a.m. Um, had to pay a fiver to get in. And when I walked in there, it was just like a fucking orgy of drunkenness. Like, I'd never seen so many people so smashed in my whole entire life. Um, for the most part, half the people that were in there didn't even give a shit about a fight anyway. They were just there because, you know, it was one of the rare occasions. The pub was open until 6 a.m. So they were there again, absolutely levered. Um, and yeah, weird environment to be in because I slept and woke up again at 2 to so, so I could go to the pub. So I was pretty fresh and I didn't have any alcohol in me at all. So I ended up going down there and thinking, you know what? Let me just like peruse the streets and see what everyone's saying. 
um, as I went out, you know, ev- hordes of people coming out of pubs and bars and nightclubs going home, and then all the stragglers along who went to continue the night, like I do, like I was going to the Yates, and um, from like for for most of the undercard, the DJ was playing. There was a DJ playing in a bar who was playing the most, you know, god awful tunes you could ever imagine. Uh, bless him though, loads of top forty stuff from you know stuff that you've heard again and again and again. So much so it made me wonder, like, what's the point of even having a DJ there if you're gonna just play like, you know, Sean Paul and Fifty Cent and you know Oasis? Like, you just you just you can you can work up a playlist in the, probably half an hour that would play all those songs and more. You don't really need to have a DJ there playing, but you know, I guess he's getting his money, he's doing his thing. But yeah, that was an absolute dread because the, the TV that I was watching it was right in front of the DJ booth because it was the big projector. I didn't want to watch it on the screen. And you're just like blaring at the tunes. He had a little smoke machine. And he was pressing every two or three minutes. It was just like, what the fuck is going on? Why is there a smoke machine in the pub? Like, it's fucking insane, man. <laughs> oh, it, was, it reminded me of that the, the the horror show nights I've had at the Nest where you go in there and you forget who... No, you go in there thinking it's one DJ and it's somebody else. And they just... They used to fucking love the smoke machine at the Nest. It was on all the fucking time. <laughs> So, yeah man like anytime you hear the smoke machine you know it's a shit night because that means it's not even that full because you, you can hear the fucking tsh, tsh. You, should, you should be able to see the smoke and think oh wow but you know we're not in a fucking Bergheim man why is there a smoke machine here but anyway whatever that that happened had to endure this DJ playing the absolute terrible beats for most part of the fight and then by the time the main fight came on finally he took the the sound off but it was all it was quite it was weirdly quite fun to watch um, Ortiz and heard fight um, on the undercard with no sound, actually. I got to actually and watch, because I think a lot of boxing people do say that when you watch boxing or when you watch MMA in general, to try and watch it without a commentary. I know some people do it with football, but I like quite, I quite like hearing the, the sound of the crowd and the chanting and all that stuff. For the most part, I kind of zone out with the commentary because some of the times they guys talk absolute shite, especially people like Martin Tyler, like one of the worst commentators we have out there. Talks, talks like his ass. Um, but I quite enjoyed watching a boxing without actual commentary. Um, heard um, one of the first fights. I think it was fighting someone called Hol- Holben or Holgum. I wasn't too sure who that was. But yeah, what an amazing fight, dude. Like for the for what? For, for I think at the end of the first round, he was getting a flurry of shots heard. And he kind of um, bunched up on the ropes, covered himself up and kind of absorbed about six or seven punches. Maybe none of them got through clean, but he was taking some kind of damage. And then just absorbed it all, took a deep breath, and then just died wailing on the dude and hit him with a liver show and just kind of sunk him down. Like, it was insane to watch, man. Like, what a great fight. He really did show that, you know, it's truly actually skilled. Ortiz as well came out really well. He tucked away his guy pretty often, pretty well, actually. Um, The dude kind of hang in there really well. I forgot what, what was the guy's name that Ortiz was fighting. I don't have it up here. But anyway, yeah, um, Ortiz fought really well. And, and it goes to show just how great of a fighter Wilder is because Wilder KO'd Ortiz and Ortiz has it's got a hell of a chin on him he's built like an absolute brick shit house has knockout power too um, so that was a very entertaining fight and then the Fury and Wilder fight was the main on the main card which was um, amazing to say the least um, is it Jake Paul coming out with uh, with uh, Fury and I think it was J-Rock coming out with um, J-Rock from uh, TD coming out with Wilder and yeah, what an amazing fight. If anything, um, just a brief analysis for me. I'm, I'm no boxing expert or anything. But what we did see is that Fury is obviously the more talented boxer. Is more, um, the more skilled boxer. It's not talent. They say he's more, the more skilled natural boxer in that respect. Like he did outbox Wilder for the most part. But what we also did with see Wilder is that resilience, that chin, um, and that ability, that knockout power, because again, boxing is not like MMA, right? With MMA, if you're a really good striker and you have good knockout power, but you don't have any grappling or you can't, or you don't have good takedown defense, you're going to get fucked up eventually. Someone's going to fuck you up. But in boxing, because most of it, you know, all the other tools have been, um, you're eliminated and the only thing you have to use are, is, are your hands for the most part. If you have that knockout power, if you have that touch that can knock out any man, right, that can put anyone to sleep, you're a real risk to anyone that you fight. Even even the most superior boxer has to be wary of your knockout power. And we saw that with Tyson Fury and Wilder. For the most part, you know, Fury kind of outboxed Wilder. Um, 
But then when Fu- when 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 Wilder when Wilder did land with a right or a left or that knockout he landed on the twelfth round as a right hook and a left just as he was going down to the floor, you saw like the absolute crazy power that that guy possesses. It's like it's just 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 insane. The first knockout you might say okay it was a bit of a fluke, you know Wilder hit um, um, Fury I think towards the back of the head right. And kind of knocked him out that way, just kind of like in an overhand scuff to the back of the head, and sort of like make um made a uh, fury a bit disoriented, and he lost balance and kind of fell over in that respect, right? You can't, you can say maybe that wasn't an actual TKO knockout, but the one in the twelfth round, bro, that was fucking crazy, like cracked him with a right, and as he's falling on the floor, another left, like just insane. And Fury's out for the count, like splayed out like an absolute starfish, looking up to the sky, eyes rolling back to his head, and then suddenly he takes a deep breath and gets back up again like an undertaker. Like, absolutely insane. I was screaming in a pub. I had my hand in my head, my head in my hands. Oh my God, while the one, I turn around and this Fury guy is getting up and he looks he, like he's okay. The guy, referee's looking at him like, are you sure? Referee wanted to end it and see if he had any kind of, if he was looking any blurry eyed, but he's pretty well. And to be honest, like, when he got back up and, he's, and they regained the, the round, Fury actually won that round, right? In terms of boxing. Like, how nuts is that? How can you get knocked out the way he did? Get up, right? Usually when someone gets knocked out like that, um, the other fighter smells blood. Um, Wilder did smell blood, but he's gassed. Again, that's what I, I was also, also surprised in. For someone that took two years out and had to lose a bunch of weight, um, Fury was a lot, had a much better cardio, a much better engine um, than Wilder did, which was very, very strange. And um, Wilder gassed himself out quite quickly. Maybe it's because of the way he fights. He's always looking for that big world star knockout, right? He's always looking for that big right hand to land. Um, it's a bit tele- uh, telegraphic, right? Um, you can see it coming from a mile away. But again, you can see it coming from a mile away. But when that touches you, you are fucking lights out. Because Fury is a big dude. They're both big dudes, right? Watching that fight, you realize just how big they are compared to the ref. They'll take up so much room. There wasn't that much room to move around. But Fury, man. For someone that big, he's so light on his feet, isn't he? Like, his head movement, um, generally, like, the way he was commanding the actual ring, holding center court, uh, dancing around the, the outside, picking Fury up, p- picking Wild off when he wanted to, with one-two combos, jabbing the right hand, jabbing the right hand, jab, 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 right hand. Like, that. I love that little feint he does, where he kind of, like, feint, feints and then goes with the right again. Like, just insane how good of a boxer Fury is. And it goes to show just how much of a pain in the ass he is to anyone he fights i think wilder against i think wilder against joshua is a very difficult fight for joshua especially if he doesn't come in with his a game and i think wilder against joshua even though um joshua is the super, much better technical boxer he gets hit a lot probably a lot more than fury does because fury's movement is a lot better than what i expect it to be but even if you look at the joshua versus klitschko fight he does get punched quite often he doesn't he doesn't avoid damage as much as he should do I guess because he's built like a you know like a brick shit house, so it doesn't really matter. But I think if if Joshua went into that fight the same way he went into it with Klitschko facing Wilder, and Wilder landed the uppercut um, that Klitschko landed on Joshua that made his neck kind of um, hyper extend, he he'll be out. There's no way he's gonna survive that. So I think for the most and in general like how this fight has transpired, it's weird how it's transpired, right? It went from Joshua being the guy that everyone was caught in, everyone wanted the, the Joshua payday and the Joshua ticket sales and stuff, right? He ended up skirting the fight with um, Wilder or whatever, however you interpret it. Um, he ends up taking a gimme, winning out easily. Then Wilder and Fury fight and they had this epic battle. They're arguing back and forth. They're exchanging slurs and being disrespectful and pushing each other to the press conference. They have this epic fight. It ends in a draw. Some people argue with which I'm not too happy. I'm not too fussed about the draw. I think it was a, pro- a pretty fair result considering the knockdowns and considering how tight the fight was overall. And then now they have this kind of like brotherly respect where they both respect each other as warriors. They both see that they're both at the fucking pinnacle of heavyweights that are around now. <clears throat> and now they've built up even more hype for a rematch, if it happens or not. They have the cards are in their hands. Now Joshua has to come to those guys with cap in hand and kind of plead and beg for a fight or opportunity to fight either one of them. It's interesting how the fight game works, isn't it? You wouldn't expect that. I think if Fury would have, if Wilder would have went in there and starched Fury in two rounds, then I'm sure the next fight would be Joshua. But now the more compelling fight is to see these both guys come back again. Maybe to see uh, Wilder bulk up a bit because he did, even though they're two big guys, you can see how thin and uh, he is compared to um, <clears throat> compared to Fury. And um, 
you know, maybe we'd see Fury get even more lean, get even more conditioned and come back even more shape. It might be a really interesting fight to see how that goes. But yeah, what a great match. I loved it overall. The judging was a bit weird in terms of how they scored it. But considering the two knockdowns and stuff and considering the, the how tight the, the rounds were in general, I think it was a pretty fair result. And I'm not happy and I'm not mad to see the rematch that happens really, really soon. So I watched that at Yates and then I made my way back to the hotel at about four I've been, sorry, about half five. And then we got to train back pretty easily, actually. So it was a really good trip overall. I love Manchester. I can't wait to go there again. And yeah, definitely looking forward to um, beginning a new chapter in there very, very, very soon. Anyway, enough about my weekend and what I got up to. Let's jump into some absolute sexy topics that I've been talking about or analyzing over the week. Um, first one here, a study finds a study. We all like those studies, right? Studies find certain things, right? So this study, um, I, I saw it pop up on Mixmag, which I check quite often. So I recommend you check that too for all things relating to electronic music. So this article from Mixmag says something I think we've all kind of known. Uh, 70% of UK gig goers are irritated by phones on a dance floor at study finds, which, you know, duh. Um, a new study commissioned by Eventbrite, um, that's the, the website that you can, you know, list tickets and put events up on there, um, has found that 70% of UK gig goers who have identified as live ticketed, who have attended live ticketed events in the past 12 months believe people snapping photos and videos on the dance floor with their mobile phones takes away from the overall content experience. So surveying a total of 1,031 people, British students, um, British adults, the research conducted by comrades has found that 69% of those surveyed would support minimal action on to minimize um, the disruption of fan photography at shows. 30% would back uh, no phone zones at venues. 41% believe gentle nudges to make phones more discreet would get the job done, while 70% re- uh, support audience spot checkers for over filming. So this is something that we've all kind of known Um Collecting feedback on survey results from the Association of Electronic ADE. If anybody spoke to the Association's Zarts and Ambassador, DJ and Producer, Mobley Record Boss, Anya Schneider. As a DJ, I want to entertain people. So Schneider, I build a set. Maybe it's an all-nighter or an after-party slot. You can't then condense that down into a little piece of video filmed on the phone. Three minutes or 20 seconds or whatever. Do I find myself playing to the forest of phones waving in the air? Of course. And for me, that's a problem because you can't see the people. You can't see the vibe. You can't see the people's faces. Uh, and this is something you know we've we've kind of go we've kind of spoke i've spoken about at length ad nauseum for you know for the best part of four or five years and it's something that you get something that you kind of realize a lot more when you go to a place like berlin which i mentioned again ad nauseum for maybe four or five years but the kind of culture that the culture that they have there around clubbing where no phones are allowed, right? Um, you know, to kind of allow people to be free, to be themselves, to kind of surrender themselves to the vibes and the night and the music and stuff and really experience it in a whole different way, right? It's all your kind of, it's a sensory overload when you're not having to always scan your phone. You're not always having to take a picture. You're not always having to think what's a good image to show online. It really kind of strips down the experience into kind of how it was back in the day, do you know what I mean? Where you just kind of lived it. If you were there, you were there. And, um, it's something that you get to appreciate a lot when you go to Berlin because, you know, the clubs are the same all, all over the world, right? For the most part, you know, everyone has a door, everyone has an entry system, everyone has, a, you know, some sort of ticket system, a bar, a DJ booth, some lighting, you know, dark room, whatever it may be. It's all kind of the same sort of elements. But the idea of stri- the, the idea that you have to be on your best behavior to get in there, right? You have to be all behaved in the queue. You can't be a dickhead. The idea that there's a guy on the door that's going to select who he wants to come into the club, right? Um, the idea that there's no pictures involved in there and you have to kind of go in there and dance. The idea that everyone in there is dancing for the most part, it really does enhance the clubbing experience. And I can say for myself, as being someone that's involved in the electronic music scene as a DJ and somebody that goes to parties, the thing that I hate the most is dancing alongside somebody that's filming all night. The thing I hate the most when I'm DJing is just seeing a bunch of people uh, filming stuff or recording or looking down or entertaining themselves with for something they saw on Instagram, which just isn't the best thing that you want in an environment. You don't necessarily get a feel of the vibe, that electricity that you feel when everyone is kind of in tune and they're kind of noticing when you're mixing a next song and they're like, woo, they're whooping and whooping. You're not going to get that if everyone's glued onto their phone. They're not going to notice anything. They're not going to notice a change in pitch, a change in um, effects, a change, whatever they're going to say, they're not going to notice it. So I'm a big fan of limiting that. 
um, by and large, right? And making sure that people are kind of concentrating and really focusing on the night. But for the but on the other side of it, you have that um, startup. I think it's called Yodo or Yoda that a lot of comedians use. Where if you're gonna watch a certain comedian do a set at a comedy club. Um, before you enter, they give you a little pouch that you kind of put your phone in and you lock, and it's got a little magnet on it. And the magnet can only op- be opened when you got w- uh, by a little unlocker on the outside of the club. So in order for you to check your phone, you have to go back outside the club and open it. So the whole point of it is that to discourage people from getting up all the time to check their phone because you have to go literally all the way outside the club to check it. But I've, I've heard a few people mention. I think Joe Rogan mentioned it, that he used it a couple of times and he's still not sure about it because during the set you will get people that will get up and go and check their phone every 10, 20 so minutes. And you can't help but notice that, right? And other people notice that too. People are getting up all the time. It's sort of like when you're in a cinema. You don't know, you, you know, you, you are immersed in the movie, but you do notice when people take out their phones. You do notice someone gets up um, too many times, quote unquote, right? They get up to get food, they get up to go to the toilet, they get up to get food again, get up to get a drink, da, 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 da. You notice it and it kind of does kind of stop and start the kind of experience for the most part. Um, but I'm not sure where the good, what a good way is to go about to what, what the best way is to do no sorry what the best thing is to what the best option to kind of rectify the situation is because the berlin thing even though the clubs enforce a rule of no photos or no videos or no or no phones to be used on the dance floor people self-police each other the first time i went to berlin and i was going to record something um on the dance floor a fellow party goer had stopped me and said hey we don't do that here and pointed to a sign wasn't someone that worked in the club somebody in there kind of um, made sure the clubbing environment wasn't disturbed by me being a jackass and putting my phone out because I think I just got in and the person at the door forgot to put a stick on my phone. I don't know. I didn't really think about it. Right, I just put my phone and tried to record something and somebody told me not to do it. So not only is it something that's enforced by the club, it's also something that's enforced by the community that attend it, which is the most important thing, right? Because the club can only do so much. And in a club like Berlin, in clubs like Berlin for the most part, the security guards don't peruse the dance floor. Some of them do, but for the most part, they don't. They just stand out. They stand at the door. They let people kind of get on with what they want to get on with. Um, so it's. But then in London, I think people wouldn't take well to somebody telling them to use their phone, right? You you see those videos of girls or little kids in schools and shit being told off by all the people on buses to turn off the phone, turn down their volume or their phone. If they're playing songs on loudspeaker to take their feet off the chair if they're leaning up on it. And you see how much of a beef that causes, right? People don't really like to be told what to do, right? If someone's speaking really loudly in a train and someone tells them to lower it or to shut the fuck up, they're not going to take too kindly to it. So I can't imagine it will be taken too well if a girl walks out of phone and tries to take a selfie and some random dude tells us not to do that. You know what I mean? You're going to get a, a, a fucking tsunami of abuse your way. So I'm not too sure what the best thing to do with it because I think in general, I just don't think clubbing culture in the UK is as sophisticated as places like Berlin. It just isn't as high brow right because i think that is quite high brow to enforce a rule that requires people not to use their phone on a dance floor and to put a sticker on their phones to cover their thing like when you go to burger and they put a cover they put a sticker on the front and on the back you can't take any pictures um at all right they have signs everywhere don't take not signs everywhere but they have most of their signs someplace don't take any pictures um everyone kind of respects that there's dark rooms so people can get up to hanky panky stuff so you're it, you'll get you get the impression that people in there respect each other's privacy right what what what, get, what happens in Berkheim stays in Berkheim for the most part i just don't think it's we have that level of sophistication in london i don't sure how they would go about enforcing that but i'm happy to see a lot of people um coming against it and rallying against it and kind of like realizing that maybe their experience isn't that well suited to it even when i go out with friends and stuff and we're having a chat or we're hanging out, or I'm going clubbing, I try not to use my phone if I'm with people, you know, just just enjoy the evening when you're out with somebody, or when you're alone and you have an awkward moment, and you want to kind of, you know, waste the time away, feel free, but if you're, if you're with people, like, in kind of immerse yourself in the environment, but I just don't think we're there just yet, at the, at the at that point, actually, and I think that brings me nicely onto the next topic, which is um, about Jack White having no phones allowed at his concert recently, right? So this is something that Jack White did and he enforced it. I'm not sure if he, he might have used that company that I mentioned, that Joe Rogan mentioned. I didn't get this article article up here so you can check it out. So this mentions, um, this is from raptitude, raptitude.com and the title of the article is Sim- The Simple Joy of No Phones Allowed. Um, I'll read it here on the screen. A few nights ago, I saw Jack White in concert. It was a wonderful night and a big part of that was due to a new rule he has imposed on all of his tour dates, no phones. 
when you arrive, you have to put your phone into a new, newer phone pouch. That's what I was talking about. Supplied by a company called Yonder, which they took, which they lock and give back to you. If you want to use your phone during the show, you can go into the cone coast and unlock it by touching it on several unlocking bases. The concert area itself remains screen free. The effect was immediately noticeable upon entering the concert bowl. Aside from the time, like the time travel, like uh, strangeness of seeing a crowd devoid of blue screens, there was a palpable sense of engagement, as though it sounds so strange to say it. Everyone can just everyone came just so they could be there, which is amazing, right? So even if you see the picture here on the screen, there's Jack White and his band uh, facing the crowd, uh, hugging arm to arm, and there's that there's literally no light shining back at them, which is weird because you never see that. Even nowadays, when people are in a nightclub or people, no, when people are at a concert, you hear the performer say, "Hey, let me get your lights in the air." When they're doing a tribute or they're doing a sad song or whatever, it's quite cool when they dim the lights in the arena and all the lights going on. You see these little you know phone camera lights, or when people are recording stuff, you always see a blue light there so imagine just seeing no lights like how it was back in the day in a you know an old school rolling stones concert or some shit but i guess it's a bit it's probably a little bit easier to kind of police or to do for a concert than it might be for a comedy gig i'm, I'm assuming right if you're in a concert and you're playing and if if you went to a concert to see jack white play or see any other band play you wouldn't necessarily want to keep going and checking your phone because you might miss something, right? Um, the whole point of seeing someone like Jack White play is they're not going to just play their, their songs like you hear them on the album. They're going to improvise, they're going to jam, they're going to stretch out a chorus, they're going to put in a new bridge. You know, there's going to be some cool stuff happening and you want to just see it. And plus, Jack White's one of the best guitar players in the world. So seeing him kind of do his magic on the stage, you don't want to uh, miss that because you have to check your notifications outside the arena. Um, so that's probably a bit more easy to notice. And as a performer, you probably want notice as much people leaving the standing area or the seating area to go check their phone but as a comedian you're probably more attuned to it just because it's so quiet and you can see everyone in front of you right um, especially if the lights are on the crowd and stuff so maybe it's a bit easier to police there but again we're seeing a bit of a sea change with these things happening um jack white obviously is somebody that can do it because he's you know he's kind of sold himself as being the kind of alternative dude that's always looking for cool interesting ways to approach his gigs and all that malarkey but i'm hoping that happens quite often and maybe sooner we see it rather than later happening in other places i do remember i think the only time i saw a band that saw a, a real limited use of phones was when i went to primavera or festivals in general people don't tend to record as much as they do at, at actual gigs in an arena in london uh, in a gig it's not in any place you know go to coco's you go to electric ballroom you go to the o2 academy in brixton you're just gonna see people with phones everywhere but when you go to a festival for the most part people are more 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 willing to just like watch the show with their eyes i guess because if you're at a festival you might not have a charge pack with you your battery might run out so you don't want to necessarily waste your time recording but for the most part people seem to be a little bit more well behaved when it comes to uh stuff in concerts as opposed to an actual no stuff in festivals as opposed to actual, actual concert but i thought that was pretty cool Jack White, um, no phones allowed tour. I think that's wrapping up now. Actually, I didn't. I, I'm pretty sure I saw tickets for that recently, but I think that's all coming to a bit of an end at the moment. Um, and another article that kind of extends on the whole nightclub uh, thing that I saw that I thought was quite interesting was um this um story, um on Mix Mag again. Um, and this story relates to door picking in the UK is the lost art that needs to come back. Um, this article is written by a person called Alejandra Cabrera. Sorry, they're, they're Spanish. Um, door picking helps build community and offer exclusivity, as the article goes. When you build the club, you're doing it is you're doing exactly that. You are building a place where people come together with the same mindset and similar interests, and they share a similar kind of view about fashion and music, says Tony Tambourine, legendary dance music PR and door picker for most uh, notorious uh, London parties of the 90s. Door policies continue to be a topic of conversation within dance music circles in the UK and wider culture, from mainstream West End clubs enforcing flagrantly racist pro policies to underground party goers debating whether a door policy enhances or diminishes the exclusivity of the dance but at clubs that endeavor to uphold the original spirit of dance music careful door picking can create an atmosphere in which ironically uh feel more well and welcoming tony has a door picker infamous raves like we are you and scala at the scala or the sign of the time which was attended by services Alexander mcqueen and bjork when you're inside you can feel it like you're part of a group he says like a special place for for your people which is what you feel you know, in the burger. When you don't get into a burger, it's a bummer. I've not got in twice, but I've got in four times. I've you know I've got quite a good um, in success rate. 
And the two times I didn't get in, I went with a big group of boys and a big group of girls that were too loud. So there was, you know, that was um, credit to it. When I've gone on my own, I've always kind of got in. Um, but when you do get in, you do kind of feel kind of special and kind of chosen that you've all kind of been... Um, the, the the topic of rated all you guys as the best you know as somebody as people that would enjoy the club and bring something to it you kind of feel like you've been chosen to represent the club right you're gonna you know you're gonna mix up the patina in there which was nice quite nice um a good venue should try to create a little alternative universe offered only to those sharing the dance floor having a topic can greatly contribute to the creation of a night right atmosphere some of the best nightclubs of the 90s like Turn Mills, The Cross and Scala had firm door pickers, which was part of the reason why the venues are now a major part of dance music history. But the only issue I have with this is that in London, because of the draconian licensing laws, you can't necessarily have door pickers the same way you did in the past. The reason is because if you're having, if clubs are having to close um, early at 2 a.m., 1 a.m., 12 a.m., 11 p.m. for the most part for some clubs in Hackney that are opening um, now in the new year or whatever it may be, um, there's not enough time, there's not enough time in the evening to get your money back, to get any sort of return on staff, on just general rent or whatever, maybe hiring a DJ if you're going to be picking people at the door and selecting who comes in, who doesn't. You kind of have to have a um, uh, an open door policy to any any anyone and anyone, right? You have to just hope that their money is good and that they're going to be able to make sure your bar or club doesn't go under. That's the kind of um, unintended consequences of enforcing a licensing law. I agree with the licensing law in some respects, right? I think if you're someone who lives in Hackney and you're having to wake up in the morning on a Saturday morning to go get your coffee or to go get a newspaper and you walk out of your building and you see vomit and you see piss all over the front of your door, it's annoying, right? And you kind of want to get those places away from your house and your house was built in the 70s, doesn't have good soundproofing and the clubs aren't really good with managing the sound anyway. They're always putting stuff out to red. I get that somehow the council did need to step in and kind of fight for your uh, cause, right? But the unintended consequence of it is that the bars and clubs that were allowing your area to kind of, you know, um, uh, succeed or to, to bring more money back into your area, whatever it may be, are now suffering because they can't necessarily stay open long enough because they can't, you know, and not staying lo open long enough means you're not going to get as much money at the bar and having a door pick at the door definitely means you're not going to get as much money at the bar because not a lot of people are going to get in. And people in London, like I said, are not sophisticated. Uh, it's just not, not people are not in, in London are not sophisticated. The climate of clubbing, the climate of going to a bar and enjoying stuff isn't as sophisticated and everywhere else the culture of it so people if if people got rejected from a bar or or a, a dive bar somewhere in london right instead of thinking okay when i go back i have to be more 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 well behaved they're just going to go around and bad mouth it to everyone everyone does it to, everyone does that to the burger anyway but there's always someone in a for every one person that you hear you hear speak badly about the burger there'll be two that say it's amazing but i think in london if someone did that sort that same kind of thing and rejected people that were coming into dive bars i think what would happen is that They'd go around bad math in the club, and then in general, it'll, it'll, an atmosphere, uh, kind of reputation would build up, and people would just avoid going there. No one would go there anymore, and it wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't be able to make any money because no one would be attending the nightclub. So you can't necessarily do that. But I kind of get the premise, and I wish it did. I honestly wish it did come back because I think we have some great spaces at the moment, great clubs, but they are ruined by the people that kind of frequent the establishment for the most part, right? Um, and it continues. Uh, Cosette McCreary has door picked for parties like Boombox at Hoxton Bar, which is legendary. I remember going to that once. Uh, Pony Step at Regine's in Paris. Richard Mortimer, Boombox party host, warned wanted a club we could all just hang out and have fun at, and where someone famous could do the same and be welcomed and not hounded. On the flip side, any famous person giving attitude and demanding VIP areas and the like was quickly shown the exit, which is amazing. Door picking is an extremely tough job if not done correctly. It can be used as a cover for racism and discrimination. Someone says, Jesus, I'd hate for someone to think that had us how to police a door, although I know it exists, because it says, my policy goes along the lines of, will this person enjoy being here and will the regulars welcome them? But I'm not about this excluding based on sex and race. I live in a I live a diverse life and would only wish to be in a nightclub reflecting that. Of course, that's one thing you don't want to see when you go to a nightclub. You don't want to see a nightclub that doesn't accurately reflect the people that listen to it, which is, which is what you get a lot with these West End clubs, right? There's a story recently about a group of girls that went out to a West End club. I think it might be tiger tiger and it got rejected um i think the girl went in there with a bunch of, of her black girlfriends and she got in and a few of her white mates got in but then when she when the black girls got into front of the queue they kind of rejected them and someone said or a manager or bounce or someone said um you guys are 10 percent of my 
income or 100% of my problems or something like that. Some fucking gnarly, gnarly quote, right? Um, let me see if I can find it, actually. What, what, the, what the guy say about it? He said, you lot, yeah, you lot are 5% of my revenue and 100% of my problems, which is a fucking gnarly quote. But it's something that has plagued a lot of the West London club, which is why most of them have to keep um, reinventing themselves and saying they're under new management because, you know, they go through these constant battles where, you know, they, they want to hire hip hop and urban kind of, they want to hire, they want to have urban type music played in a nightclub because unfortunately for those clubs, it's the, you know, it's the number one genre in world music right now, hip hop is. So you have to have these that are playing that kind of music for the most part, right? But um, when you have theaters playing that kind of music, you need to have the people that are creating it or who represent that culture also be represented in that space. But, you know, some of these places are so scared or so worried that these people are going to destroy their nightclub. They'd rather have the music played but not have them come into their nightclub, which is just insane. And you can't necessarily, you know, like most businesses, you can't run a business um, catering only to one demographic. You, you know, the whole reason why... You know, like Chinese shops or Indian restaurants within London, especially East London, don't succeed because they only service their own community. They succeed because regardless of where they're from, regardless of what um, culture that music, that food is coming from or those culinary delights are coming from, everyone around the world can appreciate that this food is fucking tasty. doesn't matter who's making it. This food is great. So that's the way they survive. And imagine trying to run a nightclub um, and you're only letting in a, a certain race of people to come in there it's just never going to survive that long which is why you see like abs and mayfair reinventing themselves every single um year for the most part right they always kind of reinvent themselves making giving a new name changing the interior under new management under new management it's the same old tricks again and again and again they don't seem to be able to do it the right way but then the flip side if you're the door bouncer at that club you might you might be convinced to say that you know Actually, I know it sounds racist, Agostino, but, you know, on the Friday night, I can guarantee you that groups of uh, big groups of big black dudes that come into our nightclubs are the ones that are causing all the problems. Now, that necessarily might be not be true, might be an anecdote to experience, but he could necessarily argue a case that every incident he's had, it's been a certain type of person, a certain type of, you know, um, character that's come into the nightclub has always caused an issue, which, you know, again, can be an issue, but I just think in general, we're just not sophisticated enough to understand it. That's why the punters in the first place that are going to nightclubs aren't going there well behaved. They just think they could just, they just think there's just, there's, there's an attitude in London. There's an attitude in London that doesn't really accept the idea of, you know the quote on um, flyers or on events that says um, we 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 uh, we what you call someone called um, we have the right to refuse entry. England people in England don't believe that for the most part. I think we we also we really intrinsically believe if I have the money I, I can get in, but that's not how clubbing works. Clubbing culture isn't about that. Clubbing culture was about you know knowing people, was about networking, was about being in the know and finding out what was going on because what was going on that you wanted to go to wasn't necessarily advertised, it wasn't necessarily put out on blast. You had to be in the know to find out about it and when you got there, you also had to be accepted by the people that are running it in order to kind of be let in. It wasn't like a right, it wasn't like a constitutional right that you had to get inside the place. So I think if a in general, like the attitude of the people going to the, these nightclubs isn't the best. The, the people running it are running it the wrong way. And in general, the overall climate around when people get rejected from a club is more so rejected. It's not like, you know, that, that place just said no. Like in London, for the most part, if someone says no to you at a nightclub in Dawson, there's plenty of places that you can go to just around the corner that would more than happy to welcome you in. doesn't necessarily mean you have to end your night there or get into a fight or get into a kerfuffle. I just think, again, it's just not sophisticated as it should be. Um, which uh, this kind of uh, article kind of touches on a little bit. I'll read a little bit more of it and then move on. Um, da -da -da -da. Door picking is about being very inclusive towards the people in your commu in a community and very exclusive towards people who towards people who won't respect that community or will aim to disrupt the dance while in the club, which is what you get when you you know when you go to a place like Manchester and you're seeing absolute any anyone just that that wild and fury felt was a good example. Anyone had five pounds was allowed to go into the club, allowed to go into the pub, which caused a bit of a weird environment. But you know, that wasn't a nightclub, that was a uh, a pub that was showing a boxing match. So it might be a different thing. But it continues if a door policy is imposed correctly based on style, vibe and attitude, the goal of creating the right space for a community can be achieved. And if people don't get in the first time round, they can notice the kind of atmosphere the club is trying to achieve and try again next time. Exactly. Simple. Um which I always did when I go to Berlin. If I go to Berkeley and I always have a list of three options I want to go to straight after so I'm not feeling bummed out I'm not like putting all my hopes into going to this place and then get rejected Tony insists that the door picker should be somebody within the industry in the club universe someone who goes to clubs who works in music who works with the people someone who has an understanding of the kind of people who should be coming in but also somebody who has got a good attitude to stand up to people who aren't desirable 
Although subjective, door picking is about trying to offer the best night possible by leaving out the troublemakers and anyone who would not be inclusive towards the club's mentality. It's important to offer a safe space. As Tony explains, you want an openness to these clubs and to people to and to people to be who they want to be without fear of people who don't really understand your sexual preference and culture. And when you hear stories about the type of LGB shit, LGB, uh, type of shit that LGBTQ promotes have to go through while running a party, door picking doesn't sound like the worst idea in the world, which is very, very true. Um, it's just an escape, you know? If your everyday life is constantly being judged by the outside world, the last thing you want to do when you go into a safe space in terms of a nightclub is then to also be judged by those inside a space that you feel like they should be more understanding of. So I'm all for door picking. I hope in general the club, the the the, the, the collective consciousness of people that go out in clubs or in night in night in nightclubs or in bars across the uk kind of rise a bit people kind of understand that this thing has to change i also hope that councils in general take a bit more of um uh a bit more of a macro look at what is actually happening and figure out that some of the actions that they're taking have unintended consequences you know it's i'm all for fighting for the rights of local residents but there is maybe a middle ground that we can kind of hit where you're not having to hit clubs with curfews that enforce them to state to close at obscenely early hours like 12 a.m or 11 a.m at night which is you know <coughs> in some countries people are just getting ready to go out just around that time and we're closing so in general you're getting people starting drinking earlier they're going to be more unruly by the time the clock the, the bar closes and just doesn't necessarily um um contribute to a uh, well-behaved clubbing environment for the most part everyone kind of suffers from it um so hopefully i'm hoping more articles like this in general and more conversations will kind of change the overall climate of clubbing in london and we get a far better and open environment um what's next on the list here ba -ba -ba -da -ba -da. oh yeah berlin local council to give up to give up to a hundred thousand euros to clubs for soundproofing talking about um an understanding of what clubbing culture or nightlife economy contributes to the overall GDP of a country. Um, yeah, this is an amazing article that I saw pop up on Resident Advisor the other day. I'll read it now for you guys. Uh, Berlin clubs could receive up to 100,000 euros as new government-led soundproof initiative comes into effect. Like, this is, this, this is what it, this is what, you know when people say, ah, oh, he or she gets it. They get it. This is it. Berlin gets it. They just get it. Simple as that, right? Um, Local council has made a 1 million euro available in attempt to reduce the conflict between nightclubs and residential areas. A new, night, uh, a new noise protection program in Berlin proposed last year comes into effect today. Berlin's world-renowned nightlife has caused uh, reoccurring issues with residents who would prefer to sleep, which is, you know, something we're seeing a lot with the Hackney issue. I think if, you, if you're not super ideal, if you're not... Um, super biased towards nightlife culture you have to accept that if you live in dawson you've been living there for 30 years and all these clubs pop up out of nowhere they bring a new energy they bring new money to the area but then they get a bit unruly they don't control their punters um there's throat there's vomit all over the floors piss all everywhere human fucking feces you have to realize that there has to be some sort of compromise has to be reached that's some sort of middle ground to kind of make sure residents are happy and the promoters are happy too or the club owners there may be right so we're having that same conflict here that you continue the city which um sees club culture as an economic benefit which we don't see here in london i don't think is making efforts to reconcile clubs and music venues that cannot afford their own soundproofing can now apply for a state-funded support via the berlin club commission they have a berlin club which is a fucking amazing for venues that have been operating for a minimum of two years application is a two-stage process basic documents are already available online starting next february an independent jury of experts will meet three times to choose the beneficiaries the beneficiaries sorry the public grant may supply each applicant with up to fifty thousand euros and projects of extraordinary importance are eligible to receive 100,000. Clubs will also have to contribute a modest amount ranging from 10 to 20% of the total fund based on a sliding scale. If the club doesn't manage to stay open for another two years, they must return the money. The subsidy model is based on an existing program in Hamburg. Both cities are striving to increasingly dense to keep increasingly dense parts of the city habitable without displacing clubs. This is amazing. How cool is that, right? Because this is the conflict that I've kind of seen happening a lot with London. That hasn't been rectified because, you know, the, I guess it's too much, too big of a job to kind of handle. And again, Amy Lamy, where are you? This is what you should be kind of noting down and pushing forward. Like, you're meant to be the night czar and all she's doing is perusing around, smooching with fucking Labour MP officials. Like, just, just, a, she, I don't know, man. Amy Lamy, come on, pull your fucking finger out, girl. Like, let's do something. But 
what you're seeing with the conflict happening in Hackney was that most of these buildings or most of these council buildings that are built next to or are in the areas where clubs were sprouting up. What happened was that the, you know, Dawson was, you know, Hackney was maybe dying for the most part. And all these hipsters came in and kind of, you know, rejuvenated it, gave it life, open restaurants, open bars, open galleries. And then the council was so welcoming to this new energy, to this new influx of uh, taxes coming in and people paying money and whatever it may be, that they let everyone in, right? They let too many people in at, the, at one time. So clubs are opening up too often, too quickly in the same sort of density packed areas. And the areas that they're usually in are residential. The residential areas that they're usually based in are houses based in the, built in the 70s. They don't necessarily have adequate soundproofing or adequate um, insulation for the most part. Most I've lived in houses like that where you have to keep the heating on, you have to close the windows and shit. You know, it's, as my, my flat, how, how we're, we're now is built in 2001 and it's extremely, extremely warm during the summer. It insulates itself very well, but other flats that are, are built, you know, in the 70s and 80s, sometimes in the, in the early 90s, aren't very well insulated so you can literally hear everything that's happening outside on the street if you open a window or even if the window's closed so what happened was that the council wanted let them all in at the same time then the residents complained which then effectively which they had a reason to complain because you know, it was getting a bit too crazy and instead of uh, you know reaching some sort of consensus or some sort of middle ground they just kind of completely displaced the clubs told most like cut most of their late licenses which forced them to Cut most of the late license, forced them to close down, uh, denied late license for other op clubs that are opening up, and then essentially made most of the clubs kind of have to, like, you know, seek pastures new in out the outskirts of Farringdon. I mean, the outskirts of, like, Seven Sisters, the outskirts of, like, I don't know, Lewisham, Peckham, all these kind of areas, and not anywhere near the city centre, the kind of the centres of Hackney and those kind of malarkey. So it's a twofold issue in that respect. But they, 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 I didn't see anyone mention something like this an initiative where clubs are in a densely packed area. And especially if they're clubs that are well regarded in their community, right? Like a Plastic Peoples, for instance, could just have got a soundproofing initiative given to them so you keep that club open. But instead, no, you displace them and you, you know, you give the, the space over to a fucking yeah, a, a, a corporation to build another office, another fucking satellite office. Just annoying. And again, I just, the sophistication of clubbing culture in London just isn't where it needs to be for these conversations to even exist. No one's really having them because, you know, it's just not something anyone wants to, want to talk about. Everyone would much rather talk about antisocial behavior and limiting this, limiting that, when essentially what has happened is that both parties just sit down at a table like grown ups and decide what the best route forward is. What is the best route forward? Because we want the clubs to stay because they offer something. And we also want the residents to stay because they offer something too. You don't want to completely gentrify areas, but you also want to allow new businesses to sprout up that are kind of um, complementary of the area, right? And that respect the environment that they're in. You don't want, again, my idea of having like, because you got folding Cannon Town as a 24 hour club, right? So my idea of having these big 24 hour clubs located in East, West, North, South, East London is great. But you also want to have located on the outskirts, so in industrial areas like the folders, it's in mostly a, in a factory-based area, not many residents around, so you can kind of, you know, you can really crack, crank up the volume and get a bit crazy. But you don't want it, you don't want those things to be the main places to go. You want people to be able to get a train to Liverpool Street and go to a nightclub um, in Shoreditch that opens, I mean, or a bar in Shoreditch that opens until four, right? If you don't want to go X or Y, you should be able to go to a club, I mean, or a bar or a a wine bar that's open until four or five. It doesn't make sense for a club to only open those places only open until eleven or twelve. It's just a really, really shitty thing that they've done. And hopefully, um, very soon that kind of gets rectified and they find a way of making sure that everyone kind of benefits from it. Because London nightlife really does, really, really, in my opinion, does need um that kind of energy to come back in some way, shape, or form. Anyway. That's most of the clubbing things I wanted to speak about. I think I'm going to continue with maybe a few more of it tomorrow. But before I leave, I thought this little quote from a book, I'm re from this book I'm reading, you know, every day of the year, uh, The Daily Stoic, 360 Days of Meditation on Wisdom, Perseverance and the Art of Living. Ah, I missed a, I lost a page there again like an idiot. Let me get it back up here. This is very apt because, you know, unfortunately, as of um, what the other day, the company that I was working for declared insolvency or bankruptcy or whatever it may be. So that means I'm out of a job for the time being. It's not that it's not something that was really that surprising. You know, I, I kind of guessed it from the very from the day before for, from, from even before I started. There were certain things that weren't really adding up, certain things that were done a little bit unprofessionally that kind of gave me um, reason to kind of be a bit um, 
uh, worried um, to be a little bit cautious about how I spend my money, which meant I saved it quite a bit. So I'm not as I'm not in as dire straits financially as I would have been if I just would have continued. If well, yeah, I'm getting paid in the month, I'll be fine. I kind of made sure that I put some money away, had some savings as well that I could be able to kind of dip into. But which kind of you know gives you that lesson, uh, which is a vital lesson to be learned for those of people you that don't save that you should at least be trying to save some amount of money every month, especially if you're working in a a job that you get paid regularly at the end of every single month try and to try and put a little bit aside for a rainy day um you never again it's not something you know that you should anticipate for your company to fold or to go under but in case an emergency something happens you know i don't know if i'm wrench whatever it may be it's nice to have the ability to be able to pull out some cash and help somebody out or to help yourself out for the most part so that was something that kind of reduced the blow i was also kind of expecting it and i wasn't that surprised but you know when these things happen you are there are kind of two reactions right you can react in terms of like putting your head in your hands crying your eyes out getting upset getting distraught or you can just see it as a bit of a wake-up call and i think for me it's a wake-up call um i've kind of always had aspirations to kind of do my own thing to kind of be self-sufficient wherever that may be um whether it's kind of doing the podcast whether it's djing um, whether it's writing whether it's being a consultant whether it's having my own brand whether it's whatever it may be presenting, whatever it may be, right? I've always had the kind of idea that eventually I will be self-sufficient and be able to kind of um, pay my way through the sweat of my brow and through the work of my own hands, do my own thing and not being subservient, right? The idea of having to ask someone for permission to go on a holiday is something that's always rubbed me up the wrong way from the very first moment I had to do it, right? It's just something that just fucking annoyed me. I fucking hate it. Um, in general, I'm being required to be somewhere at a certain time that you don't really care about. And in general, right? So, and especially with this company going under and and stuff you know you always get the idea that you always get the impression that these people that run these companies know what they're talking about they know what they're doing they're very smart very educated but they're not really they're just like me and you they did the only thing that separates them between me and you or people that haven't done anything is that um the only thing that separates them between me and you is that they decided to take a punt right they decided to take a chance and to kind of go after their dreams, right? They decided to put money on the line um, to risk it and try something. That's all that separates them. They're not any more smarter than we are, except for the outliers, like the Mark Zuckerbergs and those kind of people, right? Um, and the Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Those are the ones that are kind of the outliers, right? The kind of one percenters. But for the most part, everyone has kind of made the business or done something with um, with themselves in life. It's just like me and you. They're just taking a chance. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't work out. In this case, it didn't work out. But again, like I said, I think it's motivation more to show you that you can do it too. You don't. You know what I mean, you don't need to be subservient to anyone and everyone in order to do anything that you want to do um and yeah that's lesson that i've kind of got from it i'm kind of at a place now where i've kind of realized okay i want to do my own thing i'm going to try obviously i'm going to apply for another role and get a position somewhere else by the year by the end of the year which would be cool but i think the long-term plan in general is to not be put in a situation again where i'm where i'm kind of relying on somebody else is um somebody else's uh I'm relying on somebody else's ability to run a company in order to make sure that I am able to pay my bills or to stay alive. That's not something I want. I want to be able to live and die by my own sword. So this is the kind of motivation I need another wake up call in that regard. Um, and yeah, and it, feel, it, it feels like because, you know, at the back of, you know, if you take into account Mastered shutting down this company that I'm working shutting down, it feels as if finally Snapchat is supposedly uh, st uh, stuttering to a close. It feels as if finally the the era of like companies that don't make any sense getting back in from venture capitalists is finally coming to an end and all these fucking chances that are out there swindling money from investors um in order just to pay salaries and to kind of um, go on another month or two is finally going to come to an end which is good for everyone involved it's good for employees like me it's good for people like me also who want to have their own ideas and want to push them forward in terms of a small business entrepreneurship whatever it may be it's good for the customers because they're not going to be swindled by companies that are going to take a day and go under in six or seven months later on so everyone i think it's going to benefit everyone to finally see to finally realize that you have to have a business that makes money because some of these companies you look at them especially some of these startups like um they're great because they give you opportunity to kind of go in there and kind of get your hands dirty and take ownership for something and you know start projects you know and not you know flat hierarchy you don't have to ask permission you can just kind of just go on and do your thing but another part of it they don't necessarily understand the idea of kind of making more than you spend right they don't understand that basic math they just kind of just spend and spend and spend hoping eventually that somebody's going to buy you out um of your kind of brand overall it doesn't really make any sense to me but hey ho c'est la vie and this quote from november 4th 
um, from the Stoic, um, from the Daily Stoic, from by Ryan Holiday, kind of rings true. Um, November fourth, not good nor bad. Um, this there is no evil in things changing. There, just as there is no good in persisting in a new state. Marcus Aurelius Meditations. When people say things, when people say change is good, they're usually trying to reassure someone or themselves because intrinsically, instinctively, we view change as bad, or at least we're suspicious of it. The Stoics want you to do away with those labels altogether. Change isn't good. The status quo isn't bad. They just are. Remember, events are subjective. In- events are objective. Sorry, um, it's only our opinion that says something is good or bad, and thus worth fighting against or fighting for. A better attitude is to decide to make the most of everything. But to do that, you must first cease fighting. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm ceasing fighting for a job, fighting for employing, and just the, and just arriving at a point where I know what I want to do. I know my skill level. I know my acumen. I know my creativity level. I know my work rate is where it should be. And I'm just going to do everything that I need to do day in, day out, churn it out. And eventually I'll reach a point where I'll be able to sustain myself and feed myself. But for the most part, um, again, it's a, it's a situation to be in, but you know, it's not something I'm surprised about. These things happen in life. The, the, the best attitude to have with these kind of things, the best thing you can do. And the only thing you can do is kind of, you know, dust yourself off again and kind of go, go again. So I'm on the hunt again, applying for new positions or new roles. Hopefully I'll have something sorted out by the end of the month. And when that happens, get back on the saddle, save up again. And then as soon as that I've hit that benchmark of savings, head out and move or move um, up north to Manchester and kind of start a new life um, with my own business, um, whatever that may be um, when I figured it out in due course. But yeah, that's something that's kind of happened in terms of a life update. So you're probably seeing a few more podcasts popping up in your feed as per usual. Wow. Um, because you know that's the best way to kind of deal with these kind of things when these kind of things happen the best way to deal with them is just get, get creative man start, start doing stuff hustle um and that will kind of awaken awaken the beast before moving but anyway that's been an hour of the excellent zinger show as always thank you so much for tuning in it's been an absolute pleasure to have uh the opportunity to speak into your earlobes this afternoon this morning or whatever it may be hope you have a great rest of the day um i'll be djing this friday at tap east i'm back again at tap east the whole month so i'm there on the 7th the 18th 24th and 20th i think or something like that right i think whatever it may be so i'm there the whole month every friday at tap east in westfield check me out check me out um there might be a new year's eve party i'll be putting on as well that's t bc i'm waiting for confirmation on that that might be happening so expect news from that very very soon for all other things involving moi in terms of blog and all that sort of stuff check out my website www.xnozinga.com be able to find links to the podcast link to youtube that i will upload the video portion of this and my blog as well you can check that out too and very soon there'll be a photography section where i'm gonna i have to i'm just gonna pick up on my photos i've developed to do so you'll be able to see some pictures from all the yester years of my um nightlife excursions be displayed on there as well this has been the Exeter Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure as always, and I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace. <laughs>